Yeah. I think this is Have we got a running this order? Is, this is the order. order. Oh, am I? Okay. This is perfect. Cool. Okay, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to sit this side so I don't block out the camera. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, his desk is coming handy. <laughs> <laughs> little table. Actually, why don't we sit up the end? Do, do help yourself. I'm making it a bit easier. No, he's not. He's not. Great. Um, good evening, everyone. And just for the sake of anyone who might be watching us at home or anywhere else, uh, my name is Stephen Berryman. I'm a livery member for Worshipful Company of Educators and a visiting research fellow here at King's in the Department of School, the School of Education, Communication and Society. Um, and this is a special interest group for the Worshipful Company of Educators, which is going to focus on arts and cultural education. I'm really pleased we've got a wonderful panel tonight I'll introduce in a moment. But I wanted to just tell you a little bit, very briefly, about the why behind this particular special interest group. And it was the engagement committee of the Worshipful Company of Educators who proposed the idea of special interest groups, a chance for members to get together and have a conversation about particular aspects of education that were important to them. And arts and, arts and cultural education is particularly important to me as an educator. I'm head of music at a school in the Barbican. City of London School for Girls, and I've taught for about 15 years now, um, always in independent sector, so I've been really lucky to see, to have a really healthy budget, lots of opportunity for students to engage in really high quality music making, so I've seen a really great side of arts education, and I've been really lucky to work with arts organisations such as the Opera House and work on education projects, but I've noticed increasingly my colleagues in other schools might not have a great time, might not have as big a budget or might not have access to as, as exciting opportunities. So I'm, I'm quite keen that we have a conversation about that, but for the special interest group to be more than an advocacy group, because I think we're all very clear on the idea that arts education is really important and it's a huge benefit. So that's a conversation I don't think we need to have anymore in the special interest group, but it, I hope it becomes a forum for sharing the great things people are doing, because I know lots of the members are involved in different parts of education, different sectors, um, some aren't involved in education at all, but I know they'll all bring a really interesting perspective and I hope it will become a forum for sharing their perspective of the value of the arts and what things they're doing to promote the arts in education and arts through and ed education through the arts. And I'd like to introduce our panel for this evening. So to my right, uh, I have Dr. Kate. Uh, oh, you moved around. Sorry, I'll, 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 I'll introduce everyone in the order we're going to speak this evening. So we're going to start with Professor Anne Banford, OBE. Professor Anne Banford is currently Strategic Director of Education and Culture for the City of London Corporation, having previously held the position of Director of Ed the Education Commission, and was also, also formerly a Professor at the University of the Arts London, and Anne has been recognised nationally and internationally for her research in arts, education and emerging literacies and visual communication. And there's a wonderful book called The Wow Factor, um, which is about arts education. And after Anne, Professor Helen Le Gaunt, to my right, um, currently Vice Principal and Director of Guildhall Innovation at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, uh, where she provides strategic leadership in academic development, research, enterprise and internationalisation. She was an associate of the Centre for Music Performance as Creative Practice. CMPCP and a member of research team for Creative Works London, both funded by the AHRC. Current interests focus on ensemble practices in the performing and fine arts, creative entrepreneurship and the potential of the arts to contribute to education and development practices more widely. And from September, Helena is principal of the Royal Welsh College of Musical Drama. So congratulations. Yeah. Um, and finally, Dr. Kate Dunton, 
uh, is Research and Education Manager at the Culture Institute here at King's College London. Kate Dunton is an art historian by training. She conducted research and taught at the University of Essex before moving into an education development role, first at Brunel University, then at the University of Essex. She joined King's in January 2015 as Research and Education Manager, brokering and supporting collaborations between King's and the arts and cultural sector. So hopefully there's some really different and interesting perspectives. Um, and I'd like to start with Anne. Uh, and I wonder, could you talk about the Creative Schools programme and the effectiveness of artists working with schools to embed the arts into the curriculum? Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is just sort of unpack it a little bit because Creative Schools workshops within the UK particularly have had quite a long history and a varied history. So we had sort of initial artists in schools programs where the idea was that an artist would come in often fairly short term to do a project within the school and the idea was almost like um, the artist would come in, do the project and then go. So you have sort of murals and all sorts of other aspects but they were, they were relatively short term projects. You then had um, the whole creative partnership movement which went on for 10 years and I often feel that that was a really in some ways the most amazing time for seeing the development of work of artists working in schools because they they had a sustained view of how this could work and it was well researched and well well backed unfortunately it was cut just at the point when it could have been really you know delivering the fruit I often sort of say it's like an orchard that it was it was planted, it was tended, it was pruned, it was fertilised, supported, whatever, and then they chopped it down just as it was bearing a lot of fruits. Since that, we've had, um, for example, a new direction in London area has done a series of what they call creative schools innovations, which is the idea of actually not only artists in partnership with teachers, but actually the way you transform schools and school performance through uh, the engagement with creative professionals. And um, I've been involved in all those iterations in the UK of how artists work in schools. And so what I'd really like to do is actually unpack some of those things in the next sort of five to ten minutes and, and um, perhaps pose some questions about it. The first thing I wanted to um, mention was I suppose to look at two words particularly who do we view as artists who are these artists who come into schools because they're often referred to as creative practitioners or creative professionals um, but what what quality or what criteria might we use in saying an artist for a school um, because one of the things when um, Stephen mentioned in his introduction the wow factor which was a, a UNESCO global study of education. And one of the findings, the quite alarming findings it found in relation to arts in school is that poor quality arts experiences in schools can actually have a negative effect on children's artistic development and creativity. So it doesn't just have a, a sort of a null effect, it actually has a, a negative effect. And in fact, globally, it's around 30% of arts education is so poor in quality that the schools frankly would be better off not doing it. And I've actually challenged some schools by saying, you know, they sort of say, well, we haven't got, you know, budget or time or training or whatever to do a good job. And I say, well, ban it, you know, cut out all singing, ban the music, take down all your displays, no drama, no, because actually when they see what it would be like to not have it, they actually then become committed to have it um, and to try and put some effort into making it good quality. So I think if we're looking at people coming into schools, those artists, however we define them, it's important that what they do bring is that element of quality. I don't want that to be confused with an idea of sort of an el purely elitist art forms because my view is the quality parameters can uh, are very much the same regardless of what the art form is so it can be everything you know there's good quality graffiti as much as there's bad quality opera or whatever so 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 quality is not about a sort of hierarchical order of art forms or of types of art but how it's dealt with and I'll come back to that point because I, I, I really want to sort of um, hone in on those factors that do lead to quality in terms of the arts, I think we've got um, 
four dimensions that we need to think about. The first is obviously education in the arts. And often when you say arts in schools, people are thinking about education in the art form. So that's systematic development in curriculum time, ideally, of music, dance, drama, visual arts, the crafts, whatever you want to place within that definition. Now what we know is if we just had that as our aim, that's even a big ask at the moment because we have seen a reduction in the amount of curriculum time to the art forms. We also see a prioritisation of the art forms. So for example, music gets a lot of support or comparatively a lot of support to come into the schools, whereas dance really struggles to get any traction at all uh, within some of the schools. So it's that systematic education. What we know from the research around that is that it's very important that it starts when a child is very young and continues until at least the child is 16 years of age. Because once again, the benefits of it only really start to show with that continuity of provision. What we find is there's rarely continuity of provision. So if you look at, for example, instrumental music learning, often it doesn't start early enough, then it starts, then it stops, it may re-emerge a couple of years later or not, and then you might get a bit of a taster for a term in a cycle of arts things in year eight, and then it disappears again. So what you've actually got is not that systematic development of those art forms. Alternatively, you may have repetition. So a child may have had a very rich, for example, experience of visual arts in primary school, and then when they get to secondary school, there may not be any um, same level, you know, not the same level of systematic development. So it's a very stop and start picture in most um, schools. So that's education in the arts. You can also have what I describe as education through the arts, which is the use of the arts to, to improve teaching and learning pedagogy, the way we do education. So a classic example, which many people would know, is you know, a little piece of drama to help you do a better job of learning a foreign language, for example. The use of visuals and diagrams and, and so on to help you understand mathematical concepts. Um, the potential for education through the arts is actually enormous, but it does rely on a good induction of a good introduction to education in the arts. Um, in the city, we're talking very much about education through the arts, developing what we're describing as fusion skills, which are these skills that are needed for the future, things like problem solving, critical thinking, innovative thought, creativity, and so on and so forth. The third type I want to talk about is where art itself is an education. The art can teach us things that we cannot learn in other ways. A great example of that would be, say, Picasso's Guernica. It tells you more about war and violence than any number of wonderful textbooks that you could you know, bring into a history lesson. So the art itself comes in when human experience finds it very hard to explain something really, really complex Art has always sort of come in and dealt with that moment. It's not coincidental that often people think a lot about the music played at a funeral, for example, because at a time of great <coughs> stress, great anxiety, when our usual intellectual and linguistic skills fail us, the arts come in to actually help us to understand parts of the human psyche or parts of human knowledge that we can't otherwise access. So that I describe as the art itself becomes a sort of ultimate form of education when, when all the other areas don't work so well. And the last one is when education itself is so beautifully done that it turns into an art form. And if you've ever seen a really great um, artist working with children in a school where they have the children eating out of their hands, where there's this magical moment, which is why I called the, the book The Wow Factor. That's when you see the merging between education and art becoming so seamless 
because the education moment itself has turned into a work of art. You know, and when children suddenly find their voice to sing or they, you know, that's that moment. So when we talk about artists going into arts, I think it's really where do we want them? You know, is it in all four of those areas? Is it just the first? Who's going to do that mediation with the other three? Do we think that perhaps teachers could do the curriculum stuff but the artists will turn education into art? I, you know, I pose that as a question um, for us to think about. Um, one of the things that we're, the sort of lines in the new strategy that we're doing at the city, is actually say where cultural institutions become learning institutions and learning institutions, schools, colleges, universities, are becoming cultural institutions. And we see that, for example, in, in Guildhall School of Music and Drama, where those, the lines between what is what become so blurred that you, you can't unpack them, which I guess is the ultimate expression of, of where artists come into education and deliver on it. I promised, and then I'll finish up because you'll get stressed about the time. <laughs> um, there are, I promised to talk about what makes quality. And this was really interesting doing the global study in that regardless of the scope, the scale, the international location, the art forms, the funding, regardless of all of these facts, there were actually 10 characteristics that were um, repeated time and time again in successful arts education programs, especially those involving artists. What's been interesting, when, when that work was originally done, which led to the Lisbon Accord on Education, so it actually led to them embedding all this in how they do it, at the time I thought, well, if you had seven out of ten, it's probably pretty good, or if you had five out of ten, it's probably passable, you know. Subsequently, I've done more and more um, country research looking at this being acted out in different settings. And what's interesting is quality falls sort of exponentially when you start to leave just one or two out of these. To give an example, I did a big national evaluation for Denmark. And Denmark said, we don't get it. We really value innovation. We really value the arts. We invest massively in it but it's not having very good results. What's wrong? And they actually had sort of eight out of 10 when I started to actually look in detail. So I just wanna go through and give those 10 things because they're the things that characterize when these partnerships will work, when your artists coming into the schools will work. The first thing is about partnership working. It has to be an equal ground because it can be very disempowering to either professional if it's not an equal ground. So in the sort of early iterations of it, when the artists would come in, five days of really whiz-bang musical experience in the school, the problem was the balance with the teacher made the teacher actually go, geez, I could never do that. I would be no good at this. Oh my goodness, I'll leave it to them. And you see that time and again, in a lot of subject areas, not just the arts, where the outside expert, and I put that inverted commas, comes in and it actually serves to disempower the abilities of the teacher. Or vice versa, where the teacher's concern about policing discipline stifles the artistic practice to such a point that the poor artist is going, why did I ever agree to that? The money isn't worth it. And, you know, so that really respecting and understanding the, the professional capabilities of each. Shared planning is, is key, so they have to have time to work together on that. The other thing is about both being flexible and flexible structures. If the artist is trying to fit into 40 minute periods that are interrupted by a loud siren, the middle of the most important part of the creative practice, or if the arts organisation comes into the school and says, here's our package of wonderful art and this is how you have to fit it into your, your curriculum, either approach is not going to work. So flexible boundaries is really key. The language of the arts is crucial. People that are good at this area of work use the um, discipline 
innately as they work with the children. So when you see them at work, they have a studio approach. You know, the place feels like even if it's a back corner of a room or a you know out in the playground there has a feeling of professional air about it that's special and important and the languages of the arts be they verbal languages musical languages dramatic languages movement languages are evident in everything they do reflections really key time to reflect and rarely is that plugged into a project performance there was actually a big debate around is it process or performance the answer is performance is key Performance is absolutely key. That if you don't have performances, and that was the Danish clue. Denmark did a lot about process, no performance, therefore no one put that extra effort in, therefore there was no development and growth. Simple solution, have performances. Mm -hmm. Keeping it local, try and connect with the things that are happening at the local level. Evaluation and impact measurement. Don't just keep on going if it's not having a positive effect, change it. Accessibility to all. Now this is a really challenging one, accessibility to all. Um, I, I had the pleasure of doing the evaluation of the Wider Opportunities in Music program, which was the national um, program for instrumental learning. One of the best things about that was the word all was included in its remit. And I saw some phenomenal practice with children with special education needs, including those with really severe um, needs that they had, and how creatively the teachers and musicians had responded to that challenge to provide instrumental learning for all children, even when some of the children could just move their eyes. Um, so really complex areas. When schools say to me, Here the you know, here's the choir singing, my reaction is, it's lovely to hear the choir singing, but where do the other children sing as well? You know, where's their opportunity to sing? <laughs> and last but not least, because it's really important, is about risk taking. You know, it, it, it shouldn't be too safe. You know, it should always be, be risky. It should be trying something new. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Lots of interesting things to pick up on later, I think, and um, questions. Thank you very much. And moving on to Helena, um, can you talk about what we are really after when we're engaging people in the arts? So that layer, as you described it, beyond that of artistic craft. Yeah, I can certainly. Well, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Mm. I think I'm going to go into a slightly more micro level um, than you have, Anne, but also speaking very much from a perspective of the artists themselves, because I think. One of the issues for us is actually coming back to why are we doing this anyway? Um, what is it that we're actually after? And uh, the certainly, you know, my background is in, in the performing arts, so I'm really talking about music, theatre, dance, that, those kinds of worlds. Um, I think what we easily jump to is we are thinking about the artistic craft itself. We're thinking about those musical outcomes, we're thinking about the performance, we're thinking about the play, we're thinking about the dance. And if you talk about quality, that is the natural place that we will go because that is what we are invested in, uh, in and of ourselves, in making work. But it doesn't begin and end with that. And, um, you know, you talked about quality and, and what are the dimensions of quality. Um, of course, what we also know is that, as, as you've so eloquently said, the, the process of being engaged in the arts is a, has many, many dimensions to it and many aspects of learning. And I think as artists, it's easy for us just to forget about those a little bit. Equally, there's the whole agenda for artists of what do we consider to be quality as a professional opportunity, dare I say it. And uh, what I know um, from my own experience as a professional and in educating uh, the next generations of professionals is how easily quality is perceived to be about the professional stage and that 
working in educational settings or working with the arts where being on the hall of the Albert, the, the stage of the Albert Hall is not the end outcome, is considered to, to be second class or even prostituting your art. So in a context where you might be bringing your discipline to work with business professionals, um, mm -hmm. you, you may well find artists saying, this is a prostitution of my art. So classic case will be actors working with business people on their presentation skills, and they won't want to go near it. Now, what's that all about? It seems to me really, really important that we grapple with these issues because I think as artists we're going up blind alleys if we're thinking in those ways. So getting under the skin of what we're really after and what we're really engaging people in seems to me essential. One of the things, the, the piece that I want to uh, unpack a little bit and problem of ties is a notion that one of the things that we're really after is creativity. Creativity, creativity, creativity. Um, and Darren Henley, love him as I do, uh, talks about creativity very much um, in his book about the arts dividend. So creativity has this huge overarching priority in terms of what the arts really deliver. So he talks about it like this, and I'm not going to disagree with him in lots of ways, but I, I want to go into it in a bit more detail. He says this, Creativity is at the heart of great art and culture. Creativity changes a place and the people who live there for the better. Creative people are inventive, imaginative and innovative. They think differently and see and do, do things in new ways that remake the world around them. I suspect none of us are going to argue with that. But I think it's still, this is a little bit nebulous and easily misunderstood. So I want to go in a little bit, I want to dig a bit deeper into two particular dimensions that, are, that I, I think are potentially fruitful and we might want to discuss further. The first is playfulness and the second is making connections. Um, and I want to talk about these two, particularly because I think they are both actually hugely important through being socially constructed and socially grounded. So let's talk about playfulness first. Playfulness, playfulness I think, is understood very much in terms of a basic human instinct. We are all born with that quality. And there's plenty of research that will demonstrate that. It's also it's a kind of animal instinct, if you like. What I think is uh, very interesting about it is that play becomes something that has a, <coughs> very much a social context. It takes place in relation to others and often has an ambition towards learning a new capability, discovering something that you didn't know beforehand. Play is a distributed and interactive process in the main, for sure. And underpinning it is a notion of distributed creativity. Now, distributed creativity in the research literature has gained huge traction and um, just recently I've been uh, reading Nick Cook's new book on music as creative practice which is a very good read and reinforces once again this notion that creative practice is fundamentally socially um, underpinned. What's so interesting about this is from a performing arts perspective is that ensemble is a fundamental part of what we do. So what if rather than think about creativity, 
we think about the notion of ensemble and we really focus in on the purpose of enabling and empowering ensemble work. As soon as we get into ensemble, we're talking about self and other. We're talking about the interaction between collective and individual purpose. We're talking about a dialogical relationship between individual and group, and about the creative tension in the paradox between them. Richard Sennett, the sociologist, has written quite a lot about this, and his wonderful book, Together, talks a lot about chamber music playing. And here we start to unpack some of what's essential in ensemble, and therefore essential, I would say, to play and creativity. He talks hugely about the importance of listening, attention both to self and to the other, and focus. He talks about responding, and he then talks about being changed by that process of listening and responding. So fundamentally in this is a process of offering you make a sound, you launch out, and you receive, you hear the sound of the other. There's a humility involved in that too, because unless you're able to receive and allow that to change your response, your next offer, there is no real interaction, there is no real ensemble. And not only that, he talks about the improvisation that is involved here the point about having to be in the moment, adapting according to what's there. And that this brings a vulnerability. It brings us to a fu fundamental vulnerability, risk-taking, involved in the process of creativity. So my point really is that rather than talk about creativity, I wonder whether it's not more helpful for us really to talk about ensemble and what's involved in ensemble and the playfulness of ensemble in the performing arts because it brings out these really key dimensions. Peter Basil Jett talks about them in terms of the empathy instinct and the e empathy being the playground um, of developing who we are as human beings. But of course empathy isn't always considered in positive terms. So I'm really interested in this notion of ensemble at the heart of what the arts are about, the performing arts at least, and, and the ways in which they come back to fundamental uh, Socratic Aristotelian principles of the polis of who we are as individuals in society. So then quickly on my second point, which is about making connections. We've moved away in the notion of creativity from the idea of the individual genius who out of nothing has a brilliant idea and here we go. We've moved a long way away from those things. And one of the ways we really understand creativity, is, as you will all know, is that it's about making connections between things. It's about reordering things that may already be established in new constellations, new patterns. Um, typically, in terms of the arts, we will want to think as artists of uh, this principle of making connections in terms of bringing new artefacts together, or I'll put green and yellow together, or I'll put those notes together, or those instruments. We think in terms of new artistic products or of ways of presenting our products. But there's a Another dimension of this that I want to raise up, which is the connections that we make inside of ourselves, the insights that that, that that process of making connections brings to us in terms of who we are in the world. These are reflective and reflexive dimensions 
that enable us to perceive something more about our own position in society, what drives us, why it is that we do what we do. This dimension, I think, is often underplayed uh, and is equally an aha moment as a dimension that says, well, what if we put blue and yellow together here or whatever it is? And it seems to me that this point about the insights we gain about ourselves is a critical dimension of what the arts can bring and one that is hugely needed in our contemporary society. So I just wanted to finish with some a couple of vignettes um, to illuminate this from Gillian Tett's work. She's a financial uh, journalist, and you'll wonder what on earth you're talking about, why are you suddenly on, <laughs> on, on her. But um, she's written a wonderful book called The Silo Effect that you, you may know. And um, I've been really struck in, in that work about the kinds of insights that she describes happening for those people who are able to get out of their silos and really create transformational change. Uh, and she talks about two examples that I'll, I'll just um, mention briefly. One is uh, a guy called Brett Goldstein in uh, New York. He was a technology geek, um, profoundly disturbed by 7-Eleven attacks on the World Trade Center. And she talks about his own transformative professional journey uh, towards reform in the Chicago police from being a technology geek. And this is what she says. He reports this. So I asked myself, do I want my whole life story to be about building a large internet network which allowed people to go out to dinner? I was helping the proportion of the population that could afford to go out to nice restaurants to go out better. It was a really good idea, and I think we were doing it pretty well. But it dawned on me that I needed to do something that mattered. The connection between 7-Eleven and what he was already doing suddenly went, vroom, I've got to do something that matters. This was a gutful personal commitment. Jumping out of his normal box started a huge journey. And it was hugely risky. But it seems to me that point of being able to make connections inside of ourselves that allow some leaps forward is a really, really key question for our contemporary society. Her second story relates to the Cleveland Clinic and a, a, a very well-known heart surgeon and CEO of the clinic who was triggered by a chance question of a student um, from outside the medical profession to change the clinic completely. Um, he'd been lecturing and at the end of the lecture she asked a question which was simply this. Dr. Cosgrove, do you teach empathy at the Cleveland Clinic? And it suddenly made him think, oh, now there is a real question. And suddenly he was challenged inside himself to make a massive leap forward. Now these kind of aha moments I think are really critical and they are also fundamentally what we know comes through being engaged in the ensemble processes of the arts, or can be. So for me, these are some of the reasons why we might actually be wanting to engage people in what we're doing. And that these things are worth us thinking more about um, beyond the simple questions of I'm going to do it because I want these people to be able to play a B-flat major scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's really interesting to talk about ensemble later. Um, but over to Kate. Could you talk about how embedding arts across the university has a positive impact on the work of non-arts departments? Mm, yes, thank you. 
So um, my role um, at the Cultural Institute, I should just say the role of the Cultural Institute first, actually, just to explain that, because I think it's rather unusual at King's that we have a Cultural Institute, um, and the role is specifically to link up King's with the arts and cultural sector. So every project we do will have at least one academic or student on one side and an artist or a small creative SME or a large cultural organisation on the other. So everything we do is about collaboration. Um, I came and had a, the brilliant opportunity to develop a, a, a strand uh, based around collaborative education in the Cultural Institute because prior to that I had been more focused on um, research collaborations, um, which was, was massively exciting. And I came knowing that King's had four big health schools. So we have nursing, midwifery and palliative care, we have dentistry, we have medicine and uh, biosciences, and we have psychiatry, psychology and neuroscience. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to do some arts-based, very much what you were talking about, which was uh, you know, learning through the arts. I thought I was going to get laughed out of town um, and found that I was knocking on an open door um, and that there was a real appetite to, to explore some of these approaches. Um, we've done some work also with our Faculty of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. I'd say we've cracked that door open a little. It didn't fly open, but that's <laughs> another area that I, I'm really excited about exploring further. I've been in role three years, so, so there's plenty of time yet. <laughs> um, so um, how do these collaborations start? Well, um, typic well, there's several ways. Sometimes an academic will come to us uh, often they're, they're a bit of a teaching champion, they're an innovator, and they've heard about some work with artists or cultural partners and they've maybe got some ideas percolating but they need some help. Sometimes we kind of engineer things, we go into a faculty and we say we're going to run a workshop, come along with your educational ideas and challenges, we're going to invite some artists who we know are interested in working in this space and we'll see if some ideas gel and come out of that. Often there's a friendly dean of education in that mix somewhere who's putting out a bit of a three-line whip uh, and telling people they should come along and, and, and give it a go. Um, sometimes an artist will come to us and say, I've got this idea, I've worked with uh, you know, a health organisation, but I'd love to try this out with some medical students. Um, so often the beginning of that collaborative process and to come back to to what Anne was saying, you know, it is always collaborative. It has to be a collaboration between the educator and the artist, and sometimes the students too are involved in quite an early stage in the process. Um, if we do those kinds of ideas, that we love to bring students into those from the beginning. Um, and often those convers early convers bits of the conversation are quite messy. There's lots of ideas coming into the space, uh, lots of things being shared, lots of not quite sure what we're doing, which is very normal in those kinds of relationships. Um, but at some point we start trying, I find it useful to talk about educational challenges. So I might ask a question like, what are the things you really care about as an educator that you feel you haven't quite cracked that your traditional approaches aren't quite getting to, that you think an arts-based approach might work. And when they come to something and you see the artists sit forward on their seat and you feel the pulse rate go up on both sides, you know you've got the start of a, a conversation about something that you might do or try out. And I thought it might be interesting to share with you what are the most common challenges that come up so this is across our health schools and our science faculties at King's. Reflection, resilience and self-care is big across the health schools. They know that they are educating some of the brightest young people in the country and if we don't equip them well they're going to burn out typically within 10 to 15 years, which is a terrible thing to do as an educator. So they really care about resilience and self-care. Um, and reflection is a really key part of, of, of developing those kinds of skills. Empathy, patient-centred approaches. There's a known phrase in medical education which is moral decline. This is a, a documented effect where medical students end up less empathic at the end of their studies than they were when they started. Um, and there's good reasons for that, that you know. <laughs> What, because, it's a, because that's about protection, right? So um, the other thing uh, that comes up is embodied learning. So 
the craft of science. If you don't understand your materials or your instruments well, you're not going to do good experiments. Um, there may be things about visual attention. Um, there may be, uh, you know, the craft of dentistry, for example. I've learned a lot about the craft of dentistry. It, it's quite amazing because a lot of the work they do is unseen. They, it's all done by touch. So they have to have incredible, uh, you know, ha what we call haptic skills. Um, sometimes it's about, I've talked to, had incredible conversations with nurses. Well, I won't go into it, actually, but the craft skills they use to simulate things. Uh, that's all I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> but, but also things like the choreography of nursing. How you move around in a ward in a way that's effective doesn't put your back out and doesn't disturb the patients. I mean, there's, there's so many things about embodied learning. Um, another one that comes up is communication and listening skills. Um, that might be in the patient encounter. But it can also come into things like medical ethics. You know, are you going to be the person that says, I don't think that's quite right? You know, can you take uh, critical feedback? You know, so, so that's a really interesting area. With the scientists, uh, often they're coming and saying, uh, you know, we're getting to that point where we're doing third year projects or we're moving into postgraduate work and they won't experiment, they won't play, mm -hmm. they won't risk take, um, they won't, uh, you know, they don't like to make mistakes. Well, this isn't that surprising because they've spent all their time prior to that being really good at passing exams, working from textbooks, working in laboratories with lab protocols, being examined by multiple choice questionnaire. So it's not that surprising that when they're then told, now, let, now experiment, play, make mistakes, all that inhibition is there. Um, the other thing is about criticality. Um, if you're going into... Uh, you know, a, a world of complexity, of ambiguity and uncertainty, whether that's on a high-speed medical ward, whether you're in A&E or whether you're going into postgraduate scientific work, that's absolutely key. And so what they start to identify through those discussions is that there are certain things about the traditional curriculum that aren't terribly helpful. And they are curriculums that are overpacked with content, that are a little positivistic, that are hierarchical, often in the health schools can be very hierarchical, and that can be a little formulaic. And so all of those other things are, are not being assessed and they're not being taught. So I just wanted to give you two examples of projects that we've done to address um, some of those issues, um, very, just very briefly. Um, one was a project that we did called Thinking Outside the Box, which was for GP uh, students, uh, medical students who were going into their GP practice placement. Um, and they changed the scheme because what they used to do was rotate around a number of different GP practices. But because of the emphasis now on really understanding healthcare in a social setting, um, in a community setting, they decided to have longitudinal placements where they stay with one practice over time. And they threaded through this an arts and humanities based project that the GP placement students had to do. Now you can imagine, and they had to do it by the way, and there's 400 students in this cohort, um, and we, we grouped them into uh, uh, 40 teams of 10 students, and there was a bit of this at the <laughs> beginning. Um, I mean, I, I could talk later about pros and cons of whether you put it in the formal curriculum or informal curriculum, because there are pros and cons. Um, by the end of that project, so what happened is they workshop with some artists and they had to try out a creative activity. They then went back and thought about some of the challenges in their practices. They came up with some ideas um, about some more creative approaches to some of those challenges. So it could be things like messaging around healthy eating. It could be about isolation amongst some of your patients. It could be about language barriers in certain communities. They came up with some ideas, they came back they discussed those with their artists, got some feedback, went back and worked on them a bit more. Um, and we had some, some wonderful projects. We had uh, a, a group of students who uh, gathered um, some patient narratives and then turned them into a little anthology of poetry. All sorts of amazing projects. Some of them use film, some of them use photography. Um, so one of the students uh, said, we've been part of this uh, creative process. It feels really nice because for once we are generating content, not memorising content. 
Others talked about how moving it had been to really get to know their patients as people. And of course they'd learnt a lot about themselves and, and they started to talk about the amazing resilience and creativity of their patients and what they were learning from their patients. And, and so it had, had really broken down some of the barriers. Um, another project that we did was a collaboration with the Crafts Council where we brought some makers in and we had a maker in residence in a, a maker space that was shared by students of physics and informatics. Um, and again, that was to encourage the students the informatics students are quite good at tinkering and playing and messing around, and the physics students were terribly inhibited about doing that, possibly because they'd been in lab situations where it's like, don't break anything. <laughs> so uh, they came into a space where they could break things and make mistakes, which was exactly the point. And we had two wonderful craft makers in there. Um, and I think there were moments there that exactly described uh, you know, what, what, what you were talking about earlier, which is those moments where it becomes seamless. So uh, the, uh, the artist told me about this wonderful moment where she said that they were all standing in there, and it was students from all different levels, so from undergraduate to PhD, and they were playing with glass and water and light, and they were trying to, I can't explain the science of this, but they were trying to see something by shining light through it. And they suddenly said, oh, we've got some tanks downstairs of water. They ran, they, all of them ran down there so that they could drop these little glass things they'd been making and shine some light through and see what happened. And just like the excitement of that. And it was beautiful. And they were admiring how beautiful it was and then explaining to the artist what the scientific principles behind it was. Similarly, another artist who makes little mechanical automata um, they said to him, oh, why don't you make a mime handle? What's a mime handle? Well, we could put sensors in it, and then you just do that without touching it, and you make the automata work. So what was wonderful about this was that the students were teaching the artists. And I think possibly, as you were talking, and it struck me that we maybe have an advantage of the level playing field, because if you've got an, a, a glass maker with a physicist, there's no sort of <laughs> battleground there. You know, they know they don't know anything about the other person's practice. <laughs> the artist knows the students know more than they do. Also, when the students see the academic learning from the artist, all those higher, normal hierarchies tend to start breaking down. So coming back to that idea of, of, of the social, you know, the, the impact on the whole learning space is radically different. And then I have academics telling me, I can't get rid of my students at the end of the day. They won't go home and it's Friday night. Well, you know, if you want to, you know, we probably wouldn't, that may, might not work for an evaluation. But, you know, for me, that, that tells you something because what's happened is they've forgotten their learning. Uh, so what I find so interesting about this is you know, when you think of like the spectrum of, say, formal education from, you know, reception class through to PhD, creativity is really valued at that bottom end, isn't it? We, we wouldn't expect our children to go to nursery and not play in the sandpit and colour and finger paint. But where it gets reached out to, again, is right up the other end. Because if you really want to create the next generation of scientists, and you really want a doctor who can go into A and E and cope, and think on their feet, you've got to bring all that stuff back in. Mm. And what we're finding is that increasingly we're having to put more of it back in at this end because it's disappearing a little bit somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle. I actually asked at King's whether we could be a university that speaks up for that, and I wanted. <laughs> in my naivety for us to start saying we really value science and, and health applicants with an arts A level and we really welcome a good spread of uh, GCSE and, and do go and do drama because it's a great training for being a doctor <laughs> and I said could we make a statement about this and, and you know and say look we're, we're having to do this work at this end because it's gone somewhere back in the, in the, in the chain and actually it was taken quite seriously and we did discuss it and the answer came back no we don't want to do it because we don't want it to look like we're bashing schools because they've got enough on their plate already mm -hmm. so we didn't so want it to look like a criticism of, of secondary education but it feels to me like i feel like i'm a, a, a being an educator in higher education who cares about creativity, I feel like an activist. 
that's how I think of myself. I'm an educator activist for creativity across all learning. And I just, you know, which is why I'm so thrilled to be in this space and why I think it's such a fantastic company because you're going to bring people together from all different bits of education and, and it's not that common that we do this. Um, and I think that's all I want to say really and just and, and, and therefore how thrilled I am to be here um, in this fun, very impressive lineup. <laughs> thank, well, no, thank you. really interesting isn't it I'm, I'm fascinated by the, this middle that Kate's talking about this gap in the middle and it made me think a lot about uh, secondary education examinations how for some reason music seems to be very different to the other art forms so there's that real expectation of individual creative effort as you get towards 16 17 18 you're creating a composition on your own you are performing on your own yet in a, and it's all about the product rather than the process but for some reason in art and drama it's about the process, and that process is celebrated. I, I wondered, and maybe this is one for Helena, why do you think music is different in that respect? Why do we celebrate the individual? And that, in a way, it seems that's more about reproduction rather than creating the new, whilst in art, it's about having a sketchbook and showing your journey and your thinking and how you're changed. Mm. Why is music different? I don't, I'm always confused by that. <laughs> it's a question that can't be answered. I, I think it probably can't be answered. I mean, it's, there's probably there are probably lots of elements, but mm. I'll have a go at a few, a few <laughs> of them maybe. I mean, I think some of it some of it is to do with the canon repertoire and how a canon is perceived. Um, and you know, music is not one thing. So so what music are we talking about? I think we need to clarify this and, and probably when I'm listening to you I'm kind of hearing Western classical yeah, as that that's the kind of yeah. core that we're talking about and it's by no means the whole story. Um, but I think I think the the way in which the canon repertoire has become established is um, uh, one very important part alongside the intensity of craft skill that's required to be able to access that repertoire. And that's fundamentally different from other art forms that equally have a craft repertoire, like theatre. Uh, a play can be very difficult, but anyone can have a go, whereas you simply cannot pick up an instrument and just start to play complex notated music without a lot of um, learning first. So I think those two things go together. And another part of it is, is that thing that in, mu in, in music, there's a huge amount of uh, practicing on your own, um, which takes the whole thing into that more individualistic domain. Whereas a theatre training, a dance training, tends not to happen on your own. Now when it gets to visual arts, it's a whole other thing, isn't it? And I, it's fascinating what's happened in visual art. Um, and I think others should, should talk about that. How would you like to take that up, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is always that social dimension, even when you're on your own, because you, you, you sort of bring the others with you in a, in a virtual sense, because you've heard other people play. And, you know, in visual arts, you often, you might be working on a in a studio on your own, but if you go into most artists' studios, it's full of books, it's full of pictures on the wall and sketches and photographs and scraps of material. And so they're bringing the other in, even if they're actually on their own. And I think it's, so it's still in a way in an ensemble, but it's just in a different way of looking at it, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Did anyone have any questions, Susan? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to use a phrase I don't usually use. I've been blown away by this this evening. I really mean, have. Um, it, it's opened up a whole new thing for me to think about, a whole new. And you know, those people who book and who haven't come, they are such idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on the film, they can get it virtually. <laughs> and talk about um, economic as well as social mm. development mm. in society mm. and in our nation. We, we, there is a growing movement to, to take the, the phrase STEM mm. and make it STEAM. Yeah. And for me, you three of you, between you in very different ways, 
have provided a body of evidence just in this short amount of time to demonstrate why that should happen. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going to be able to, to prosper in or even maintain our current mm -hmm. uh, situation mm -hmm. in the future unless we make it steam rather than stem. Mm -hmm. For all the reasons you've said and many other reasons as well. Mm -hmm. And for the future of work and employability and all those other things which are facing us. Mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people really don't understand. They really don't understand what's going to happen. I'll be dead, I mean, I don't care. But it's our children, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, 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 so that's what you, you said. And that for me. How, how do you take that forward? How do you combine those things you've been saying tonight as evidence for, ste for STEAM, for the development of STEAM, and for making a bit of a noise about it, and mm. getting people to notice it more mm. in terms of policy? How do you do that? I sense Kate might want to respond to that. Well, one. yes. I mean, there is, there is two arguments, and one is the industrial one. Um, you know, which is about growth in the creative sector and how much, you know, how important that is to our economy. Um, and, and I guess, but I guess the other one is perhaps less easy to articulate. You know, that one is one you can maybe do and fix. I, actually, an interesting issue for, for universities is when you, you track the destination of your leavers. Mm. Um, you're, a lot of work in the... Uh, cultural sector is freelance um, and, and so actually you know it, it, it doesn't always show up well um, but I, I mean if you think about you know the VNA and why that was founded it was founded to promote design and industry wasn't it um, and so so if, if we if we want to see ourselves and a lot of politicians do want us to see ourselves as this incredibly creative little island um, that can be world leading in, in innovation and technology, um, then um, you know you, you have to be creative about that if if you want to keep one step ahead. Mm. But they've got to translate it into policy. They have. Right? I've got a horrible feeling it'll be down the line when it's where you're starting to see the negative results of it that it'll get picked up. I mean, I I. I probably not the best person to ask about how to translate it into policy. I know that it should be, but the mechanisms by which you do and, that. And is it not to say the creative industries, because that's mm. setting it apart. Mm. What, what I've been yeah. hearing is that you, you don't set it apart. No. It underpins and goes through exactly. and, and actually enhances all the rest. But what I, yeah. I think is really interesting is even for the city of London Corporation to appoint my role, and yes. it's not me personally, yes. But for the City of London Corporation to say, we want a strategic director of education, culture and skills, mm. that like your inclusivity mm. in future applications. And interestingly, mm. some of the banks who used to always say, well, you need to have this A-level in maths and you need mm. to have this, they're actually saying, and the arts, mm. because they're realising the type of person they were getting, yeah. it's no good having a whole organisation of them you need the other sorts of people. Yeah. And so I think there's a really um, strong move back to yeah. say, actually, to be successful in this world, and I mentioned it in passing, this notion that we're going to very much embed, which is the these fusion skills, and you've both talked about, I'm sort of <laughs> listing them off on my paper here, um, because to, to be able to be successful, whether it's a doctor, mm -hmm. a scientist, an IT tech person, a teacher of the future and now, you need to have all those capabilities that you've both described. So I don't, so I think perhaps it's already happening mm. and policy's going to have to pay catch up. Mm. Because, you know, it, it, it's happened before. You know, it, it, was, it was interesting, I was at a, a global education forum which was hosted in London at the same time as they had the big Davos thing. And what they said is, you know, we went through the age where it was very much about physical. So, you know, when we were farm workers and things like that, is that you know, it, it was about physical strength and physical work. Mm -hmm. Then in the Industrial Revolution, it was very much about knowledge. You have to have knowledge, you know, it's really important you have knowledge. And now, and this is education people saying it, we're now entering the phase where it's about, about creative thinking. It's about these different empathetic values mm -hmm. 
that it, we, you know, because having the other two, the physical or the knowledge, is no longer required for most of the jobs that we do. There are these other sets of skills. And so I think it is happening in policy, and it's we have to, in a way, almost document it and, and play catch up because it's not coincidental to have a position like I now hold. You know, that position would have been unheard of even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sig you know, I've sort of always done it and it was almost like a funny thing because it's like, finally a job that matches me, you know. But, <laughs> but it's that you do have to have, it's a, it's a way of thinking for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really powerful signal. So I think mm -hmm. policy is there, but the documentation hasn't caught up yet. Mm -hmm. But the sad bit is, some of the amazing resources that you had that would have made the UK lead on this, mm -hmm. we've lost some of it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to go madly scrambling around and reconstruct it and find it again mm -hmm. to be able to take that, that forward. And I think that's a, re that's a sad thing because we actually, you know, we had, we had that resource, we had the, the diamonds hidden, you know, mm -hmm. and we've, we've sort of left it a bit and I think that's that's a little bit sad but yeah no I think it's there I'm quite positive thank you, thank you. Elizabeth uh, just to say thank you very much a very interesting and engaging discussion um, may I just address this question to you Kate mm. um, you mentioned the fact that there is this gap between the creative creativity of children at a tender age there's that missing gap and there's that gap or at a potential PhD where they're trying to play catch up. And I agree with that. Um, as an educator um, and working with uh, children and adults, I have noticed that there is a clear lack of creativity and imaginative skills. And much of that, I believe, has been attributed to technology who has literally eroded that skill. My question to you, um, and it's something I've pondered a lot, with the <laughs> increase in enhanced technology, how do we battle and combat this? Because it is, to a large extent, doing a lot of the thinking for students. Mm -hmm. I sometimes compare myself to when I was at school mm -hmm. and how I would think, draw, write, and I, mm -hmm. I map myself against them, and I think, my goodness, um, this is so simple in my mind, but they can't do it because they're so reliant mm -hmm. on a technology. And that's a battle that we, we're mm -hmm. facing right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to know your take on this. Mm, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think there is something really different about doing something by hand. Mm. I'm a great believer in drawing physicality. Yes. And I'll tell you a funny story. I took some dentists to the Courtauld Institute to look at some paintings, which is a wonderful experience. Um, and as we were going in, I said, can you put your uh, mobile devices in the locker? And one girl, she had her iPad, and she went, she said, no. <laughs> and I, I do what I never do, and I got a bit bossy with her. And I said, just do it, because just trust me. I, and if you, yeah. if you never do this again, that's fine, but I, I want you to go with, with this with me for, a, for an hour. So she was very reluctant. You put it in the locker. And I, and, I, and I had them drawing, and I had them free writing. If you've ever done free writing, it's when you, you just write continuously without stopping by hand. Um, and we did some word spirals. And, you know, there's something very different, I think, and I, I'm, I believe there's research on this, that it does sort of use different bits of the brain. But we have also brought back in the mobile devices and used them creatively. Mm -hmm. It's about breaking habits of yes. thinking yes. that that is the same as looking. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what I've said to them is you can take some photographs, but you're only allowed to take three, and you've got to think carefully about what they are before you take them. And we've also used those disposable cameras, yeah. <laughs> which was fun too, because they went... It doesn't work. <laughs> we did have some packs of completely d dark photos as well because they, they didn't know how to wind on. And, um, but, uh, but they love the disposable cameras because there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of uh, cool around low, low tech, isn't there, as well. So they, were like, they just thought this was like so much fun. Um, but, that, but I think it's just about getting out of the habit as you say, of it being a proxy mm -hmm. for looking or thinking or creating. Once you've broken that, I think you can actually bring technology back in really creative yeah. yes. mm -hmm. ways. Um, and they do all sorts of amazing stuff with blogs 
um, and little videos that they make because the mobile phone now you can do incredible things just with that technology and uh, they as I say that the health students have done some lovely things using uh, like little animations that you can make now quite easily with the software that they've used to, to create their own health messages but the point is they're thinking about it and it's considered and they're choosing mm -hmm. when they use it and when they don't and when it's when it's a creative tool and when it isn't so I think that's much. probably thank my you, thank you. Yes. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm Jonathan I was um, actually a student here um, 20 plus years ago doing <laughs> children's nursing Ah, okay. And I'm now at the University of the Arts, so ah, I'm doing, I actually am joint lead on pedagogy reading group, and the thing that you were talking about, which was just to do with that uh, grid about how education, four dimensions that you referred to, I'll try and give it a name, to <laughs> but um, that's really interesting in terms of the stuff that we were talking about over there, but I was particularly interested, I guess, and sorry, you're going to get more like you can, you, you end up getting all the questions that I'm coming your way. I'm quite interested because... I set up when I came to the University of Arts, I thought to myself, one of my problems, because I went there as a student to do art theory and philosophy, mm -hmm. I'd already gone through to all stuff like economics and management, I'd come a long way through the health system, being involved with Royal College of Nursing, Royal College of Surgeons doing innovation, so I was miles and miles away from where I started. And I thought to myself, I'm, I'm now getting into a point where I just feel like I'm going over the same kinds of things over and again. I'm still I'm sort of like running into this rut. So I thought, how can I get as far away as possible from what I'm doing? Yeah. Um, I'll do art, because that's miles away. <laughs> but I can't draw or sculpt or mm. sing or dance or anything. So I thought, I'll do art theory and philosophy, because there's a little bridging bit. <laughs> um, and I did art theory and philosophy. I mean, I'm just finishing up my dissertation at the moment. Um, but when I was there, I decided to set up a group which is called UL Creative Community. So it was part of the university. Also, it was a student body, and I thought this was really useful because it doesn't. You're not bound by any institutional kind of thing. You're not told your department doesn't do that. That's beyond your remit. It was a student group, and we were very, very involved. And one of the projects we did, because again, along the sort of like where I had various sort of like connections to different areas, we worked with the UCL Medical Art Society. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because I was teaching in the medical school for a while on professional communication skills, and yeah. there was a big rap thing we did as part of our you know, yeah. sort of professional teaching about how to sort of like relate to different kinds of groups of people. But I'm sort of like wondering a bit on it. I guess the, the thing I want to focus on really is when I set this UAL Creative Communities, the idea was that when I was doing this, I would engage the students. It would be a very flat thing. We'd be able to work with them and do really interesting different things. We wouldn't be boundary by institutional structures. The great thing about it was we ended up doing quite amazing things. We put together something with UCL, with their public health department, we did um, for the Medical Research Council National Week, uh, National Education Week, we set up um, something on uh, cohort studies. Yeah. We were involved, we entered into Europol, and we got art students doing and competing within the Europol thing. But interestingly, I was always really excited about coming back to King's and being involved and doing stuff with nursing school, because it was actually yeah, yeah. where I started out. Um, and I came back here and I kept finding that because, I mean, I, maybe I'm not enlightened, but I guess I've had experience of some of the obstacles for that, for the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I thought to myself, it shouldn't be so difficult because I know the people. I know people who get to this department, that department, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. other, and so on. But what I found is people were not receptive. I mean, the way you're talking now is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And it kind of embodies what I felt as a student. Yeah. But it was very, very resistant. I wrote to, I said, I'd really like to do this thing. Um, with the nurses, an art yeah. thing for the next med medical research council thing. I didn't even get a reply. Yeah. Now I'm doing it with Middlesex. This isn't to criticise King's no, no, it's, no. Just a, it's yeah, strange yeah, how yeah. I, even when I sort of like follow these routes, there was a lot of resistance. I mean, a week ago I got something which was saying, do you want to be a mentor for um, midwifery and nursing students? And I thought, yeah, I could probably do something with that. And I could get into it and I could sort yeah, of like start yeah. bringing different perspectives. But my question, after all that wandering around, is how do you sort of like start to make the change? You said this job couldn't be conceived of that many years ago, the title of the job, mm, the yeah. stuff that's going on there, and you've obviously raised this issue about how do we get this STEM, this STEAM to bring together. Yeah. On a practical level, how do people break these um, sort of like silos and things yeah, that you're yeah, yeah. referring to? How do you actually convince somebody until they yeah. sort of like reach the stage of this enlightenment yeah. that it is worth having that door open? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I don't know how that is, because there clearly are people who are very, very clear about this. Yeah, you know, yeah, they have yeah. Great vision. yeah. But there's clearly every yeah. step that you might want to take from one of those other perspectives which hinders. Yeah. 
I, I guess for me, you know, you come at it from two two angles, possibly. You know, you, you in any setting, you'll always find some local champions who are open to this. Um, and and uh, you just have to knock on the right door at the right time. There's a certain amount of serendipity in that, I think. Um, and the other way is if you can find someone a little bit higher up, it will give it a little bit of kind of... Uh, Give it uh, that, that the sort of respectability, I suppose, and gives people permission. I mean, if your dean says this is great, then then you can more confidently uh, experiment with that. I mean, don't don't get me wrong; it's not like everybody uh, yeah, <laughs> welcomes us with open arms. Um, you know, uh, we had an artist in resident and a, 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 an academic sort of popped her head around the door and said, "I don't know what you're doing here." Um, what a load of nonsense was her exact phrase. Um, so you know that that does still go on. Um, I think, you know, I think it's a culture change. Uh, if you're at a party and there's a group in the corner having a good time, you tend to be a bit drawn towards them. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when you when you see educators uh, like a colleague in midwifery who says. I was getting burnout as a lecturer and this has reinvigorated me and it's totally reconnected me to my teaching practice and that was one thing I didn't say is that actually when we get do these projects we are thinking about the students but we're always thinking about the staff as well it's always about their development um, and their enjoyment and satisfaction of teaching and, and I missed that out but that's actually very important and when their colleagues see them reinvigorated um, and see them passionate, and they then become your best advocates. There's nothing like a new convert to go out there. And because they speak the same language, and because they are respected as colleagues, they can do a lot more than I could do going in there saying, why don't you take your student to an art gallery? <laughs> as an art, you know, as a, an art historian by background. But when a midwife you know, says to another midwife, why don't you take your students to an art gallery, then that's a different conversation. And so um, actually in that department, because, and I guess it depends actually on the culture that's already in the department. If they're quite a close team and it's quite collegial. I was going to say it wasn't like the nursing department. I wrote to the university champion yeah. kind of like big thing. So it was a very central thing because yeah. I thought it would be across. Sorry, I don't want to criticise my own department. Yeah, yeah. Amazing place. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it was more of a question about Yeah, so if, it, if, if that's already there, then uh, I think it, it spreads quicker than if you're in a big department where in, internal communication is not so good. I mean, I think the other thing is as well is that sometimes with the, the best will in the world, people just sometimes feel under the cosh. And when they're stressed, you know, it, it, it does take energy to, to rethink. And sometimes it's easier just to batten down the hatches and, and keep doing what, what you're doing, um, which is a shame because ultimately I think it is energising. But if you're just a bit burnt out um, and the pressure is on, you know that that then sometimes if you just knock on the door at the wrong time, yeah. you you won't get and a I'll response. I'll give you a really fast answer as well, yeah. which is I always use the technique of saying it's a pilot. It's yeah. people yeah. let me do all <laughs> sorts of crazy bonkers things because I say it's a pilot, yeah. and for some reason that gives you permission to try something. Yeah. So don't say I want to do this forever in a day. Yeah. Just say I want to try this as a pilot. And people will go, oh, okay. I guess it was like you talk about it from the race of light up, and I guess if you're thinking about it from the student perspective, as yeah. people who think, I've got this great idea, and I mean, obviously, University of Arts, I mean, there's 21,000 students there. They've all got great ideas, but they have an opportunity to sort of like take it anyway. I reckon if they had made it here, which they clearly didn't bother turning up today, <laughs> if they'd come here, they'd be like, wow, there are people who think this on the other side, because I just would have thought they would have no time for what I've got to say. Yeah. Uh, partly, possibly, an economic thing. The money going to come from, but partly because of the thing, like, people don't think like that. Mm. You know, we do our thing, we were, we were in the middle group at school, like, yeah, and yeah, what yeah. group do, or whatever. I like, can't that mm. too see. So it's just intrigued from the other side about mm. how people go through it. So thank you, thank you very much. Gosh, one final quick question. Um, David, would you like to just to finish our one final question? Uh, yeah, it wasn't going to be a question. Oh, of course, okay. You, you made a point, I'll, I'll um, respond very quickly then, which is. I thought you were entirely wrong in separating music from the other arts in the way you did. And the reason is that, in fact, word well, ensemble, which would be a bit of a keynote, if I may, um, has, <laughs> has run through music. I mean, after all, we use it much more in music than any, uh, in any other art form. Um, it's only uh, the fact that we have individual 
practice and soloists and examinations that stop us recognizing. But this is where I'm leading to, which is that actually all the arts are united surely by being both about individual and about community and society. Oh no, I, yeah, I completely agree. It's more the, the assessment you know, of music, in particular the creativity, exactly, yeah. assessment of creativity of music I felt was and about indeed, the individual I mean, rather the than the ensemble. Very quick example. I, on Friday I went to a Saturday a speech day at a school where I'm governor. Uh, one of the pieces performed was a wind quintet by a 16 year old uh, for four of her friends and herself playing the most eccentric combination of instruments mm. and she had entirely <laughs> woven the piece around their individual strengths so she was embodying the principle of music and of the other arts being about the self, self-expression, self-discovery, self-development and about togetherness and community and I think you know if, if we needed a kind of watchword for education in and through the arts it would be about the interplay of individual and community, individual and ensemble. Oh, thank you, that's a great point. And I think this evening has very much been an interplay of uh, an ensemble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> really, interesting, really interesting ideas. And I, I thought to myself, this would be a really short evening, I'm sure. Well, I've very little to say, but clearly there's a conversation that needs to keep happening. And I hope that a special interest group will be that forum for that very conversation. But thank you very much, Kate, Anne, and Helena. It's been really interesting. And um, round of applause, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what a terrific, thought provoking evening. You know, things have improved. When I went to school, by the time you get to the sixth form, you either do arts or you do the science. At 11, your voice was tested, and if it wasn't good enough, you didn't sing in the choir because the mistress sang with the bark choir, and so she only wanted the best. So things have improved. And as somebody who then became a mathematician, believes in STEM, I strongly believe in STEAM, so it's now a bit <laughs> way on But no, so thank you very much, a lot to think about. So thank you to our speakers, and thank you to King's for hosting us, yes. which is you know, brilliant. And thank you to Stephen.